constructive fraud. Okay. And the fraud is built into the system. Right. Constructive fraud. Okay. Now, so, the really so, cool thing, right. the really cool thing, though, the thing is, if you could ever prove constructive fraud, there's no statute of limitations on constructive fraud. Okay. When there's a fraud by a man or a woman or somebody who's done something to you, you've got, even in, in, in their statutory rules, you've got a time limit in order that you can go back and defeat them. In their own rules, in their own rules, constructive fraud may be exposed any time. If I wanted to prove constructive fraud by the Constitution of the United States, I could do it today, okay? If I could prove that constructive fraud, and there's no statute, I could do it today. So if somebody has committed fraud on you in a constructive fraud kind of a way, while they might may or may not be personally liable for it, the system is liable for it, and it vacates everything and everyone that was ever ruled against by virtue of that particular error in system. Okay? So the possibility exists if you can prove constructive fraud, and this is what they do as a matter of course. And eventually, if you win your case, as you probably will, and go back, and recruit 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 other Canadians to come and say, you know, we got pooped on in the same way, you could actually come up with a case that could prove constructive fraud and overturn and vacate all of those judgments that were ever made by virtue of that particular operation. Okay, so let me, let me, say, let me stop you right there, Greg. Greg, stop. Because, like I said, I could actually tell you a case where this is a true case. Believe it or not, it's going to sound goofy, but you got to be careful when you use the fraud, like constructive fraud or fraud in the inducement or fraud in the factum. There's a difference. There's, there's an actual case. I'm telling you, man, it's called Burroughs versus the Superior Court, okay? This is a funny case. This only happened in 1985, so we'll see if you can watch the silliness of this. The doctor, Dr. Stevens, called up the victim, okay? And he's saying that he was Dr. Stevens from the hospital and that the victim had a life-threatening disease. So he told her, uh, he presented her, believe it or not, this is true, this ain't a joke, with two options. The first option was to have a painful surgery costing the victim $9,000. You can Google this. It's B-O-R-O versus Superior Court, 1985. Two options he gave her. He said, you could have a painful surgery that cost you $9,000, or she could have sex with him, uh, and it only cost $1,000. Okay. So the victim had intercourse with the defendant, believing at the time that her life was threatened and that was the only choice she had to cure this horrible disease. Okay? This is true. The victim, upon learning the truth, brought the charges against the defendant for rape. Okay? The court held that this was fraud in the factum, and therefore there was no rape. Okay? It was fraud in the inducement, because the deception related not to the thing done, the sexual intercourse, but merely of some collateral matter. A matter like the cure for life that disease. So that's what he really did. So you you got to be careful when you use fraud in the, in the inducement or fraud in the factum. Like when you say fraud in the factum, fraud in the factum is more of a uh, misrepresentation. Uh, it causes somebody to do something without realizing the real risk, the duties, or the obligations. It's like saying that up. Um, uh, let's see, John tells it, let's say, say some guy tells his mom that he's taking a college course on handwriting analysis and for his homework he needs to her to read and sign a pretend deed. So his mom signs like this deed believing that, you know, John said he's just trying to work on his uh, lawyer skills. And uh, while John really has his mom sign this blank piece of paper or this deed and then he fills in the rest, that's fraud in the factum. Okay, that's 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 just flat out fraud. He just had his mom say, "Oh, I'm just doing some hand analysis, hand, handwriting analysis skills." Can you sign this blank piece of paper? So she signs a blank piece of paper, and he writes, "Well, you just transferred all your property over to me." Okay, that's fraud in the factum. See, fraud in the inducement is just a trick to try to cause somebody to do something um, to take away your real property away from you. Okay, it's right. Fraud, right. And fraud in the inducement and fraud in the factum on the statutory side, both have a time limit in which you can prosecute. Cool point. 
But when you claim that you're a man, you have no statutes of limitations for anybody doing you wrong, whether it's in no, but you know, like we were saying earlier, sometimes, you know, we can, we, we as men can move freely in any jurisdiction we want. If we're right. going to go and operate in that jurisdiction, there's a time limit, there's a statutory limit to prosecution. Right. And well, so my point, my, the point that I was making was that, you know, fraud in the system, if right. the system itself is fraud, there right. is no. Statutory limitation. What I'm saying, that was a great example that you gave us that it was, it was fraud in the system. But if she signs a contract and she works with these people, then there's going to be a statute of limitations in what she can and cannot do. Because somewhere she signed a contract. So they will have latches on that, built into that contract, what the parties can and cannot do, or what one side is liable for, what the other side is not liable for. But as long as she stays as a man or a woman and does not bind herself with this intercourse with this monster, this, you know, because she's afraid of some crazy home disease she's going to get, she stays away from it. But this monster ever tries to claim that we had an agreement. She knew all along. And she's bound by these statutes of limitations. No, she's not. Because she never had a contract. She never talked to these people. Anytime these people looked at her in court, she was like looking at ceiling tiles because she's like, what? Are you talking to me? You got a claim against me? Is there a claim before this court? Yes or no? I haven't seen one yet. Well, I got all this paper. Man, is that a claim? Well, no, it's a, it's a claim. I only answer the claims. I'm a man. I'm a woman. I only answer claims. I don't answer that. Anything else? Sir, Mr. Dan of Black Robe, is that true? Does man only have to answer to a claim? Is there a claim verifiable before this court? Yes or no? No. And what are, the hell are we doing here? Well, they want to just talk jibber chair about the code and how you're never going to get your kids. Okay, great. Is that based upon a verifiable claim? Is this, or is this not a common law proceeding? No, this is an administrative code proceeding. So, oh, you think I'm some sort of code uh, decipherer? You think I'm going to sit here and try to get some jibber-jabber and, and try to and interpret code? You think I should get a code interpreter here called a lawyer and attorney to decipher your jibber-jabber for me? No, no, no. I don't trust any of this because the first duty of that attorney or that lawyer is to this court, not to me, is to the court and the rules established under those codes. His first duty isn't to the rules of common law to protect his client. His first duty is to protect the code, the, the rules of the law that are before this court. His first duty is to the law. The law before the court is the rules established by the other side. Whatever the other side establishes as the rules of the court, as the law of this court, that's his first duty to do. So if I try to tell my attorney to say this, object to this, he's going to tell me, shut up. They're, they're, they're in compliance with the rules of the court. And you say, no, 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 I got these rights. Not in this proceeding, you don't. You're the defendant. You didn't establish the rules. You don't have those rights. You will have them in common law, but you don't have them here. Shut up and sit down and stop. And she's like, but I have a constitution. You ain't got boo. I got the great charter of 1982. You ain't got squat. Sit down and shut up. The terms are written in the contract. There is no contract between me and the other side. What? What do you mean there's no contract? There's no contract. Tell them to bring the contract forward. Oh, they definitely have to have a contract. They have something that binds you to that. Oh, I'm telling you, Judge, they don't. Tell them to bring it forward. Tell them to bring a law before the court. And so the judge says, is that true? Is there any contract? Is there any law before this court? And they say, well, uh, no, sir. So I go, oh, my God, do you realize what they're doing to these people? Are? The other side knows exactly what they're doing to you. If there's no contract before the court, if there's no law before the court, they're filing a false claim. They're, 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 it's, it's frivolous. It's a, it's a perjury. It's, it's all kinds of words for that. But for moving barratry, it, it's ridiculous what they're doing. Because like I said, the very simple claim that I had Jesse Dill was basically saying, I, is in her name, and says, claim the wrongdoer's trespass against my property. Exhibit A. And Exhibit A was her property. Number two was there, there's no law that exists which binds the eye to the wrongdoers. There you go. Since there's no law that exists which binds the eye to the wrongdoers, there you go. Is there any law that has a jurisdiction control over me? Is there a contract? Is there something that binds me to the wrongdoers? No, I have no idea who these freaking people are. I've never seen them before in my life. They just manifest themselves in front of me one day, and I have no freaking clue what they're doing in my life, but I want them gone. Okay, that's number two. Number three, I require the delivery of all said property to be under my jurisdiction no later than April 18th, 2013. Number four is I will place a charge of $1,000 per day per said trespasser and said agency for the, any failure in the restoration of property on said date. Number five. If the placement of all said property does occur on and or before April 18th, I will forgive those who trespass of their debt 
as I would wish others to forgive me of my trespasses or my debts. That was the whole lawsuit. That's all you need for a lawsuit. Nothing else. 